You might be forgiven for thinking that most people in a pre-industrial world died in their 30s. After all, many of us have heard that life expectancy in the past tended to be around 30 years old. Unfortunately, statistics are a messy business. This 30-year expectation is an average measurement of how long a newborn child can expect to live. Perplexingly, your early 30s are actually one of the less likely times that your kind of medieval man or woman is likely to die, unless we're talking about in war. The sad truth is, in almost all societies before the 1800s at least, about 50% of newborn children died before they finished puberty, or before around 15 years of age. If they made it past this gauntlet, a person could reasonably expect around 50 years of life, and some could live to very old ages indeed, again, barring periods of great disease or war. One of the greatest achievements of the modern world is that our prepubescent mortality rate is now around 5% globally. From 1 in 2 to 1 in 20. There is still a lot of work to be done, but through this and many, many other advancements, life expectancy has raised from around 32 in 1900 to over 70 today. I'm not seeking to imply that developments solely in child rearing have caused this statistic to skyrocket. After all, even counting all of the children that survive through this horrible period, the life expectancy on average for much of history it tops out at about 50. But it is true that many, many developments that have happened holistically across all age brackets and all class brackets and all places in the world have had a considerable cumulative effect on us as a species living longer. So what does this all mean for our fantasy world building? Should we also be emulating these population dynamics? Or does something about a fantasy world necessitate a change in perspective? It is my firm belief that magic is a world-shaking force in any fantasy world that chooses to employ it. Even the most meager of conjurer's tricks reshapes traditional expectations of what the world looks like. Let's imagine a ship's surgeon in the 1600s with access to prestidigitation, one of Dungeons & Dragons most basic units of magic. They would instantly be able to generate warm and cold towels, clean dressings, mark the skin precisely with areas for amputation, and conjure basic tools to their hands in an instant, like scissors, for example. This would drastically improve outcomes without a doubt. So let's look at what's actually causing all of this death throughout most of human history. Well, for the children, we're mostly looking at disease, malnutrition, poor sanitation, and lack of access to treatment. Basically, to solve these problems, we need medication readily available and seasonally resilient food, developed understandings of hygiene, and a logistically well-linked world, or mass urbanization. To be fair, the average high fantasy D&D world should by all rights have these covered, mostly. Wounds are pretty easy to cure. I mean, there's literally magic to do so. Diseases can be cured too, perhaps through restoration spells or simply the mere presence of a paladin. Food becomes much easier to farm with druidic or clerical magic to control the weather or simply force a field to be incredibly productive through plant growth. Equally, an organized enough society of sufficient spellcasting ability could theoretically feed its entire citizenry with the Goodbury spell. To understand the spread of disease, either in the field or theoretically, the commune spells work wonders. Communing with nature will tell you exactly how many creatures in the nearby three mile radius are infected with nasty, civilization-threatening diseases. And commune itself can, if used correctly, get a god to tell you, well, 
exactly how such diseases spread or which magic herbs can be used to cure them. And from instant summons to teleportation circles transporting things is really quite readily an option. The higher magic you're setting, the less justifiable this sort of an, a ridiculous infant mortality rate should be, even if you're very, very, very critical about the altruism of the human condition. As progress, at least in a world that is interconnected globally, as any world with a magical network of sendings should be, is very hard to miss out on. I can only think of a few places in our world where progress has not spread at least partially globally. Most notably the North Sentinel Islanders who have made it very clear that any progress that the world can offer is not actually what they're interested in. But what about less high magic worlds? How easy is it to actually develop magical healthcare? And what are the obstacles to understanding it? First, some decisions must be made. Considering we often see the classical elements of earth, wind, air, and fire as foundational truths of fantasy worlds, should we not also consider that the medical truths of these worlds should take a sort of classical understanding? Take, for example, Galenic medicine. Instead of the four elements, why not Galen's four humors, the necessary liquids supposed to be in proper balance within the body? Phlegm, blood, yellow bile, and black bile. This is not just some weird classical idea either. Galenic ideas were foundational to at least Western medicine right up until the end of the medieval period. This is why leeches, bloodletting, cooling, and heating were common treatments. They simply served to put these humors back into balance. Or perhaps we adopt other understandings of historic medicine as the truth instead. I will admit I am even less expert in Eastern medicine than I am in Galenic medicine, but an extant and functional medical system based on energy flow and points of tension and release could be an excellent foundational truth for a fantasy world. My point really is to ask why it is so common that we assume that diseases in fantasy uh, use germ theory. Why microscopic organisms and viruses are the ones responsible for attacking our cells. After all, could microorganisms not be considered, to some extent, creatures? In which case, a simple casting of spirit guardians will create some sort of a clean room, devoid of all microorganisms. In some ways, the older and more traditional understandings of disease and medicine make more sense to be true in a world that takes so much from the medieval period. Especially in worlds where the gods have a hand in designing how things work. Because if the god of disease and pestilence is the only one who understands DNA, viral infection, and microbes, you can bet that that knowledge will be the greatest gift that god could ever bestow upon their followers, and that every single other god would be seeking that hidden truth. Put simply, why would the gods go through so much trouble as to create a secret category of organisms and a system of chemical building blocks of life, and then proceed to keep it a secret? for thousands and thousands of years. Another big consideration generally is, is what magic can actually cure. Is tuberculosis, which is you know, the world's biggest historical killer, on the same level of curability as say type one diabetes or I don't know, Down syndrome, which if any of these can reasonably be cured. Modern medicine would say just the first one, perhaps 20 years from now, it'll be the first two? We don't actually know because a hundred years ago, the answer was zero. In a world suffused with magic, perhaps there are herbs that can cure genetic disorders. If genetics 
is even such a complex science in these worlds? Perhaps a rare herb exists that can cure symptomatic rabies, something modern medicine finds impossible. Lycanthropy, for example, seems a pretty clear analogue to both rabies and chronic genetic conditions, at least as it causes a permanent change in how the body functions. So if that can be cured, why not other things? It's a very slippery slope, you see. Generally, magic in its most basic form can fix wounds and maybe curses. Alchemy can fix both curses, wounds and diseases. And dark magical rituals can fix diseases and perhaps even deformities or even wasting diseases or maybe diabetes. As I've said, it's a very tricky line to draw. What about medical progress? It's all good for new rituals to be revealed to solve new problems and diseases, but is there actually any need for new techniques if traditional medicine is the fundamental law of the world? If that's the best medicine there is? If leeches and acupuncture are literally the best ways to heal people, outside of magic, which is, tends to be rare, then a culture would not need continuously advance its medical understandings, right? Well, maybe. But what is feasible is that magical medical progress keeps occurring as magic becomes industrialised. The trouble with everything we've discussed so far is that there's very little reason for those in power to actually help the poor. Rare herbs, expensive or difficult magics or secret rituals are not likely to be employed while they remain rare, expensive, secret and difficult. Whether we're working under a feudal, capitalistic or democratic system, some illnesses will be too expensive to treat or have too many bad optics in terms of the dark rituals you have to undertake to be viable, to be cured en masse. But in a world with a magic system that is somewhat innately powered or divinely powered, helping people may actually be just as simple as improving one's own personal power and skill of the mastery of your magic or of your faith. We can at least rely on sentient creatures to covet self-improvement. Some of the first magical advances will most likely be diagnostic tools. If a close friend or family member is inexplicably ill, a person who has potent magic will likely seek to solve this issue magically. Much like the early scientists of the Enlightenment sought primarily to use this new science to tackle these same trials. As magic is a potent force with seemingly limitless potential, diagnostics will most likely come first, but any sort of treatment or hospice care will most likely fall by the wayside behind thoughts of a cure. This is because in many fantasy worlds, magic is not necessarily seen as part of a broader holistic process, but a tool to be wielded to achieve results. The former setup certainly does happen and I do personally find it more interesting. But I do wonder if without a scientific method of sorts, magical curative science, might revolve more around grand solutions than temporary alleviation of symptoms. Especially as in most settings we do actually see a lack of magical assistants who act in a similar fashion to folks like nurse practitioners. Magical assistants in many fantasy testings tend to be those who, well, seek the grand mage's power, counsel and secrets, rather than lay folk who got into this to help people. In essence, we're unlikely to see a strong non-magical tradition of medicine bleeding in to magical medicine in very quickly at all. Much like our own real-world history of sidelining women in medicine, leading to very, very scarce progress in reproductive and maternal health for quite some time. Thus, I expect that folk medicine and 
magidemic medicine will often have quite the gulf between them, as they fundamentally might focus on very different things. Folk medicine will prioritise comfort, care, and living with illnesses while maintaining a community spirit. After all, you often actually just have to be around support and cope long term with the ill members of your own society. Hospice care, end of life treatments, and general soothing will be priorities when proper treatment and elimination of disease are not possible in a traditional setting. Magidemic medicine, on the other hand, will likely be filled with researchers and specialists commissioned by some noble, church or city to solve a problem. It's likely that if you're in need of treatment for a specific ailment, well, you'll need to petition the organisation who's paying that researcher or simply make do with traditional curatives. Of course, this also changes in worlds where magic is an innate gift. In that case, I can see less parallels with academics and researchers and more parallels with itinerant holy men, uh, saints and gurus. So, should your fantasy world be a horrible, squalid place where half of all newborns won't live to adulthood? If it makes sense, sure. Should you have a world where medical science is in its infancy, or where the actual science of medicine is very, very different to a world of cells, bacteria, viruses, and mutations. Both ways can work. But I think the best stories are told when we can engage critically with the world and our assumptions. Because sure, we can have a fantasy world ape medieval population dynamics and mortality rates, but it's better if it all makes sense holistically. After all, going back to a D&D styled world, gods of childbirth might spread boons specifically to help newborns survive. Magic is certainly an exceptional curative and plants, concoctions, and magic itself can heal wounds instantly for a price. In such a world, high infant mortality might actually be incongruous, unless you have a reason. Perhaps goblins love the taste of children above all. Maybe there's a magical wasting disease that the sages simply can't figure out how to fix. Perhaps in certain locales, children are cursed, or their dreams and nightmares tap into the magical nature of the world, making their own murderous bogeymen real. It could be that children are used in war, in dangerous work, or that in general, medical research and curative magic is locked away in the temples or the courts. I firmly believe our worlds only get more interesting when we examine history and culture and start interrogating our world's basic assumptions. You don't need to even change anything about these assumptions. But reasoning them out in the context of the world's own rules can only enrich the stories we see to tell. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this cursory discussion has helped in broadening your thinking about medicine and healthcare in fantasy. If it has, I'd appreciate a subscription as I come up on now a year of making content next week. Speaking of, if there is anything you'd like to ask me, a sort of FAQ situation, let me know. I might consider putting that as an addendum to my next video as kind of a celebration for the anniversary of the channel. So feel free to ask away if you're interested in anything. But with that said, I've been Tom, otherwise known as the Grungeon Master. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.